As a child, I was impressed by the legend of the flood. The life of our civilization was coming to an end. The days of the people were numbered. The water level rose higher and higher, and the last of the people on the mountain peaks were drenched in rain. People who were punished for disobeying an angry deity didn't know their guilt. They just wanted to live. They just loved their children. They just wanted to go back to their homes. From a scientific point of view, all the water on the planet isn't enough to drown all life. But what, by and large, is the difference between them and us? After all, if a monstrous element flooded your city or your country or an entire continent, could you survive? Or would the fate of Noah be waiting for only a lucky few? It happened on the morning of December 26, 2004, 100 miles west of the island of Sumatra. Millions of years leading up to this day, an ancient confrontation between giants had gone unnoticed. The Indian Plate, which was once part of the supercontinent Gondwana, had been pressing with increasing force on the neighboring Eurasian Plate, squeezing it and trying to push it up from a depth of 19 miles until the growing tension shot out like a compressed spring. The ancient gigantic plates slipped relative to each other, and the monstrous impact of the seafloor was thrown up and arched up several feet for almost 1,000 miles. The point where the cataclysm occurred is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. More than 80% of the largest earthquakes on the planet occur here, and tectonic plate shifts have occurred regularly over several centuries. However, at that time, there was no system for early detection of a tsunami in the Indian Ocean, or a system for notifying the population in coastal areas, and carefree tourists continued to enjoy sunbathing on golden sand, playing with children, and diving into the incredibly beautiful and safe ocean. Huge masses of water received this earthquake of incredible strength and moved from the epicenter towards the coast. Tad Murty, ex-president of the Tsunami Society, estimated the total energy of these waves at 5 megatons in TNT equivalent. This is twice the total power of all the ammunition detonated during the Second World War, including two atomic bombs. But in the first hours after the quake, the wave height didn't exceed 20 inches. Meeting such a wave in the open ocean, a ship wouldn't even have felt the pitching. But when the front of the wave began to slow down on the shallow coastal water, the height of the wave increased sharply with each passing moment. By the time the residents of the coast and tourists saw the incredibly monstrous wave and realized that it was bringing death to all living things, its height had reached 50 feet. This water monster struck an unexpected blow on the coasts of Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, Thailand, and other countries. People relaxing on the warm sand under the hot sun, sleeping under the air conditioning of their rooms, making their choices on the menu before breakfast at a local restaurant, were all caught off guard. In the first seconds, the dark gray wall of water demolished the beach of sun chairs and umbrellas with ease, without any resistance. Within a minute or two, it was crushing overpasses, hurling cars, destroying man-made metal and concrete. It didn't even matter who could swim better. The flood of overturned cars, uprooted palm trees, and thousands of tons of smaller debris swallowed up everything in its path, dragged it several miles inland, and dumped everything there, regardless of the twisted metal and corpses. An hour after the catastrophe, those lucky enough to survive the first killer blow 
continued to die without medical attention in destroyed buildings, under fallen trees, and from their injuries just lying in the mud. Only a day later was first aid able to break through the garbage barricades built by the giant wave and help those who managed to survive to that point. Later, it was estimated that 300,000 people drowned on the coast, were left under the rubble of buildings, or were crushed by the flood. Some of them were never found and are considered missing. The greedy ocean must have taken their bodies when the water receded. It's a terrible tragedy, but it seems that such a tsunami cannot threaten all of humanity, only certain regions. But what if the source of the wave isn't an earthquake, but something more terrible? This is the ancient crater Chicxulub. Its monstrous size is 112 miles in diameter, and its original depth is up to 12 miles. It was formed almost 67 million years ago when an asteroid with a diameter of more than 6 miles crashed into the peninsula known to us as the Yucatan at great speed. The impact power of the asteroid is estimated at 100 teratons in TNT equivalent, which is exactly 1 million of the earthquakes in the Indian Ocean. How would you like the size of a tsunami 160? 60 feet high, or 330. It's difficult to imagine the consequences of waves that could sweep across continents from end to end across the planet. But one thing is clear, the survivors would be few. And it's not guaranteed that under the conditions of their new life, they would be happy. And now look carefully. After all, the asteroid just fell on the shore and the volume of water thrown out was actually very small. If it had hit the open ocean, for example in the Mariana Trench, the depth of which is exactly the size of the asteroid, as if they were created for each other, we would now be in the same situation as the dinosaurs were. Yes, a tsunami is a monstrous, deadly disaster, but its impact is instantaneous and afterwards, humanity has time to restore its strength and take up some measures. For example, build an early tsunami detection system for rapid evacuation of coastal areas. But there may be more terrifying flood scenarios when the water level rises for a long time or even forever. In 2015, NASA experts showed that the level of the world ocean is growing faster than expected, and in the coming decades, it will rise by three feet. If the warming trend continues, the glaciers at the poles of our planet will continue to melt, and the level of the world ocean will rise and rise as all the ice on the planet turns into liquid. Here's a map of the continents of this future. At first glance, it may seem that the land on it looks the same as before. But then, as we approach Asia, the scale of the tragedy becomes clear. Huge cities like Kolkata and Shanghai, with a combined population of almost 19 million people, will be swallowed up by the ocean. The real catastrophe will occur in densely populated areas of Southeast Asia, in China, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Territories with more than a billion inhabitants will be hidden underwater. The annual reduction of land will present new challenges to humanity. The area of arable land will be reduced, and there will no longer be enough food for humanity. New ocean expanses will increase the humidity of the atmosphere with their evaporation, and eternal rains will flood the crowded cities of the continents. But there's also good news. The rising water level and flooding of the land will occur over a period of decades or even centuries. And we'll have a chance to do something in time to ensure the possibility of survival on the smaller territory that remains. Most likely, this will be enforced by birth control, mass production of chemical food, and a new architecture of multi-tiered cities.
Of course, humanity considers itself safe. When considering possible scenarios of the apocalypse, a pandemic or world war usually appears, but not a flood. Few people believe in it, but in fact the ancient Sumerians, Greeks, Arabs, Hindus, and Chinese knew about the flood, often without being able to communicate and transmit this knowledge to each other. We can only guess how terrible and deadly the ancient catastrophe was if all the peoples of the world have preserved the memory of it, even after thousands of generations. I wonder how likely it is to happen again. Now we know that the monstrous power of the wave's impact and the lack of food in a condensed and overpopulated territory are the most terrible things that threaten humanity during tsunamis and floods. But now you're about to learn that there are more dangerous factors that aren't created by unbridled nature. We create them ourselves. In the history of humankind, you can find many different examples of us organizing ways of survival. And I'll now show you two of the most recent ones. This is footage of the tsunami in Japan in the year 2011. About 18,000 people were killed when the monstrous disaster struck. Tens of thousands of survivors were cut off from the world. Fresh water and electricity weren't available in the affected areas. And the country's economy was severely damaged. How did the locals survive? The answer is that during these difficult times, there were no crimes. The victims showed high mutual assistance. Everyone understood mutual social responsibility. No one moved to the head of the line when food was being distributed. No one pushed ahead of women and children in the queue for rescuers. Thousands of ATMs were overturned and smashed all along the coast, but not a single yen was lost. The best human qualities shown by the victims in relation to each other help to rescue and save many lives. But there are other rules of survival to cast aside all stages of evolution and turn into an animal. This is footage of New Orleans. As a result of Hurricane Katrina in 2005, 80% of the city was flooded. Most of the residents were evacuated in advance. The lives of the remaining people were objectively not threatened by anything, except other people. Gangs of looters on boats first took over the gun shops, then the jewelry stores. The city was captured by a wave. No, not a tsunami, but a wave of human violence. Just two weeks later, the main human values in the captured city were food and women, just like tens of thousands of years ago. It got to the point where the police were able to enter the city to restore order only with the support of the National Guard. So, if we want to be ready for the apocalypse, whether it's a flood or any other disaster, we need to start not with fuel and food supplies, not with the ability to hunt and get water. First, we must ask ourselves, who are we? People who built a civilization with the support of their own kind, or predators who survive at the expense of the weak? Share your opinion in the comments, but remember, the truth about ourselves we learn only in practice, and it may surprise us.